and welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We are absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. We will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Kiki Yablan. Kiki Yablan, KPA CTP, CPDTKA, has been training professionally since 2011. First under Laura Monaco Torelli at Animal Behavior Training Concepts, and currently under her own name. She offers private in home training, barring public health crises, and online training and consulting. Since 2014, Kiki has also worked under Dr. Susan Friedman as a co-instructor for Living and Learning with Animals, an eight-week intensive course in behavior analysis for animal professionals. In 2018, Kiki began pursuing a master's degree in ABA at the University of Kansas. She recently completed all coursework and is working on her thesis. A former editor of Outside Magazine, Chicago Magazine, and the Chicago Reader, Kiki publishes a blog on her website, has written about behavior and training for other outlets, and has edited lectures, articles, and books for other behavior professionals. Most recently, Kiki has accepted a position as Karen Pryor Academy faculty starting sometime in 2021. So without further ado, it is my very great pleasure to welcome one Kiki Yablon to the show today, who is patiently waiting by. Kiki, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we're really excited to have you join us for this conversation today. Um, I'm excited to learn more about you. I've followed you for quite a while on social media now, and um have run across you in other places as well as in the Animal Training Academy community, of course, and I'm super excited to catch up with you a little bit more today. Cool. So first, before we get started today, let me say congratulations both on completing the coursework for your master's degree and the new position as KPA faculty. Um, Neither one a small accomplishment, both really, really cool things to do. So congratulations to you for both of those. Oh, thanks. Well, I think the, the coursework is the, I think is the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, was discussing with, um, with, with Susan Friedman the other day, the, how I was feeling a little bit unmotivated to, to get to work on my thesis. And she said, that's the test. You have to do it even <laughs> though you don't want to. <laughs> so... Well, congratulations on reaching this point, and I have no doubt that you will do it, even though you don't want to right now. (laughs) I appreciate your confidence. (laughs) Um, I really enjoyed reading a bit about your background here, and I know when we caught up before the episode, we had a chance to chat about some things that you've been involved in um, throughout your life as well. And it sounds like, like a lot of us, uh, you didn't maybe set on a straight path right to animal training, but your kind of life's path has wound you in several different directions, landing you here. So I kind of wondered if you could start us off today by talking a little bit about how you came to the world of animal training. So when I, I grew up basically in an animal free home, um, my parents had an Irish setter when I was born named Sean, of course. And uh, 
my, I think the, the vet, my mom says the veterinarian told them that Irish setters were too stupid to train. So they didn't bother. Um, they didn't bother trying. And he was, you know, this is an era where dogs sort of ran around the neighborhood freely as did children. And he got himself into some trouble once in a while. But when I was five, I think he somehow, my mom tripped over him while she was pregnant with my brother and they decided that he, it was, I think they probably just felt it was too much. And they, they did literally give him to a farm, the proverbial farm. Um, and when I came home from kindergarten or wherever I was coming home from that day, I saw him getting into the ladies station wagon and I was totally devastated. And I asked for a dog for every, every holiday with a gift attached, I would, uh, ask for a dog. And I, I think I stopped around 17 or something when I realized like I'm not going to be here next year. Um, and uh, I didn't get one, but I did get a gerbil at some point um, named Rat. And I was pretty obsessed with dogs, but I didn't really know anything about them and proceeded to go away to college, graduate from college. Uh, I wanted a dog then, but I ended up getting a cat because I thought that was all I had time for. Um, and I didn't end up getting a dog until about 16 years ago. So um, when I was, well, <laughs> I can give my, give my age here, when I, 16 years ago when I was 35 or so. Um, so we got, we got my first dog and uh, I had bought a book. I thought I knew what I was supposed to do. It said to buy a choke collar and a brush and stuff like that. And, uh, and I got ready to have a dog. And then, uh, my next door neighbor at the time was a marine mammal trainer at the shed aquarium named, uh, Jessica Whiten. She was just on live at the ranch recently. Um, she's no longer my next door neighbor. She, she's now living on an Island off an Island in Iceland curating belugas. <laughs> um, but she introduced me to clicker training sort of right from the beginning. And although I didn't really understand what she was doing, it looked magical to me. And so I went looking for someone who taught classes, which is how I found Laura. Um, so we took classes with Laura and then I just like many dog owners, I thought, Oh, she's done. She's trained. And then she proceeded to grow into some behavior problems that we didn't really recognize as such when we got her. And like many people, those behavior problems sort of led me to look for more information, to get some bad information along with good information, and then try to figure out how to sort it all out. And that's uh, how I found myself about three years later, having not read any books that weren't about dog training <laughs> in years, and asking Laura if I could uh, intern with her. Um, and then I did uh, intern with her, and that led me to KPA. Um, KPA led me to uh, I started I started to um, I started to train professionally after I graduated from KPA. Laura uh, had me teach classes and take private clients and things like that. And uh, she also was kind enough to let me have my own business on the side. So I have had that all along, but. It was sort of the proportion sort of changed over the years. Um, and KPA, the KPA community led me to Dr. Friedman's course, um, which I, which just sort of cracked my head open. Um, and I felt like it really sharpened everything up and gave me a, a framework to work within, which is sort of how, what I think I'm good at not just good at floating freely in space, trying to <laughs> make stuff up. Like I like to have some, some walls to touch against. Um, and that's what the principles of behavior sort of are for me. So I took her course in 2012, uh, which, and that combined with some workshops, I did some nice intimate workshops in St. Louis that Dixie Tenney who's another KPA trainer put on with Jesus Rosales Ruiz. And, and later Mary Hunter, um, those two things combined sort of really turned me on to behavior analysis as opposed to just dog training. And uh, Jesus 
sort of casually mentioned one day at dinner or something that at one of those workshops that UNT was thinking about starting an online master's program that would focus on, that would sort of have some animal specific angle to it. And it just sort of snapped then like, oh, I really want to do that. And then I waited around for a while and they still haven't developed that program. And so that's where I started looking for other programs that were just you know, not necessarily animal specific, but uh, a master's master's programs in ABA that I could do from here in Chicago where I live. Um, so, um, so that led me to University of Kansas. Um, I was actually looking on their website because it's that's where he, that's Jesus's alma mater, <laughs> and just happened to stumble across the fact that they were starting an online program that year. So I, I found it in June, applied in July, and started in August. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, and then when I started that, that's when I, uh, I had to, something had to go out of my schedule. So that's when I stopped uh, working with Laura, actually, which was a, a lovely experience to, to work with her. So. Does that, does that catch us up to today? It's, it sounds like <laughs> think, it catches us up pretty close to today, at least, if not yeah. to today. So, and it also sounds like you've had a wonderful experience on um, your learning journey in the world of training. How has, uh, I would imagine several of the listeners, I know I for sure, and I would imagine several other listeners too, have perhaps considered trying to pursue um, further education in the area of behavior analysis. So I'm just kind of curious if maybe you want to talk just a little bit about your experience in the um, online master's program, how you feel like that has maybe impacted your training or how you see yourself um, growing from that and and being able to use it going forward, if that question kind of makes, hopefully makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. Um, so it's been, it's been great. It's uh, doing it online. Um, I think there, there's a, an increasing number of programs that are online and some of the differences between them have to do with whether, with what kind of final requirement they have. So some have a practicum, aspect, which would be working with humans. Um, and that I just, I'm sure that that would be extremely enlightening, um, because human behavior is so complex it probably makes everything else seem, you know, easy, but, um, but it's just not something I wanted to make time for, uh, or had any interest in pursuing after the end of school. So I was looking for a program that had a thesis, a research-based thesis requirement so that I could try to do a research project, um, you know, that was related to animals. Um, so, and then the other thing I was looking for was some sort of, some sort of rigor. I mean, I'm sure all those, pro all the programs have some sort of rigor, like they have requirements to get in. Um, one thing that I liked about KU's program was that it they're they're trying to build a one-to-one -one correspondence with the curriculum um, that that the on-campus students get. So um, and yeah, I'm trying to think about this a little bit more. Um, I had to cut back on work a bit to for me to manage it. I can't stay up as late as I used to. I can't pull all-nighters like I could when I was in undergrad or whatever. So really had to kind of plan time for it. Um, and it was pretty intensive, but also very enjoyable. It was really enjoyable to go talk behavior analysis, <laughs> you know, for hours every week and um, to have in you know, small programs. So to have tight, to have access like that to um, professors, like I felt like I had a despite never really seeing them in person, except at conferences, uh, it was felt like I was able to develop a pretty close relationship with all of my professors. So I don't know. It was, it was neat. Um, <laughs> neat. Um, I guess what I wanted to get out of it was more, 
nuance. And I will say that uh, working with um, with Susan Friedman for years, I really felt like I came in well prepared for it, despite not having any um, any background in psychology or or any kind of. I think I have one statistics for the social sciences course. I went to college for journalism, so, and it was a while ago. So, um, so I feel like uh, that was really not just taking her course, but teaching it for the last, you know, te- helping teach it for the past four years. Like, there's nothing that sharpens your skills at, at articulating something like having to teach it to somebody else. <laughs> um, so I actually felt like I came in very well prepared for it. And I think, you know, uh, I think, I think that it would be a good program for dog trainers, even though there's no dog specific content because they're very open to it, very open to people working with animals, participating in the program and, um, and because there's not a practicum requirement and you can do it online. So that was kind of blathery. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. I'm sure that um, I know I enjoyed hearing uh, a little bit more about your graduate experience, and I think that other people will too. And um, I don't want to get too far off on that, but it, it does sound like you were, uh, in, in your thesis, you will be able to focus on some kind of animal related thing. If yeah. I'm- understanding correctly okay so that'll be that'll be interesting and something to for something for all of us to look forward to reading in the future (laughs) knock on wood (laughs) yeah Um, and yeah, I could see where your experience as an instructor, a co-instructor with the living and learning with animals course might really help prepare you for at least beginning a master's program like that. So wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to share all of that with us. Um, so moving forward here, I was hoping that you might, I know you have a lot of experience training. I have been following you on, um, uh, dog training by Kiki Yablon. Did I get that right? Is that the yes. name? Yes. I wish I had just named it Kiki Yablon dog training, but I didn't. So that's what we're stuck with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have been following both your blog and uh, the videos that you post on social media um, from dog training by Kiki Yablon for some time. Actually, my first experience with um, Dr. Friedman was at in outside of Chicago at an weekend LLA seminar. Oh, I and, was there. Uh, she, uh, she referenced you there. And I remember her maybe even, maybe even pointing you out. I don't know, but I know, I think she showed a video of yours or something. And that's when I was like, who is this person? I need to pay attention to them. So I've been following your stuff ever since then. And um, you're always posting lots of really, really helpful training videos and blog posts for people um, with a lot of kind of everyday behavioral type challenges, some of them a little bit more maybe extreme um, than others, but a a lot of things that just people and their dogs sometimes need help with. And so moving forward here, I was hoping that you might share with us whether it's something with a client maybe or something that you yourself have worked on with your dog. Um, But if you could share with us a recent training related challenge you have experienced, um, kind of how you worked through that challenge and some things that you learned from it? Well, we, you and I talked a little bit about these questions before the podcast started. And, um, the thing that, uh, this is not a huge deal, but it is something I'm sort of proud of. Um, the room that I'm talking to you from is my office and guest bedroom. And I spent, when I started graduate school, um, I barely really spent any time in here um, because, you know, I just tend to work on the couch or in in my, in our regular bed or whatever. And um, so I didn't spend a lot of time in here anyway. um, Most of the training that I did with my own dog, like most people was in the kitchen. (laughs) Um, And then when I started to take classes, um, in grad school, the classes at KU are live on Zoom, and they have rules that you have to sign your agreement to before you start. And one of them is no pets uh, in the room. 
no pets, no cats crawling over your shoulders, no kids running around in the background and people preparing dinner behind you and stuff like that. Um, believe it or not, they also have to have rules like don't call in from the car or take your clothes off or whatever um, while, while you're in class. Um, but I guess we're all more familiar with that now because of Zoom. But um, uh, so I spent then the next two years being very careful not to reinforce my dog Pigeon for coming into this room. Um, and we were really good. <laughs> so especially if I was in here with the computer open, she would just kind of be like, and like go somewhere else. Um, and then COVID hit and all of a sudden this is now my workplace and I need a dog to demo with. So, um, so my challenge was how do I, but I also still needed to be able to talk to my advisor and things like that on, on zoom without her, you know, being here. So my challenge was how do I teach her that now this is a place where training happens, but also be able to tell her when it's not happening. Um, and so the solution is actually fairly simple, but it's that, uh, I developed a signal. Um, these are kind of my favorite kind of challenges to deal with things like, you know, that involve like just giving clearer signals to dogs. Um, uh, so I have a mat, a, I call it the welcome mat. Um, and if the mat is out, training is going to happen in here. Doesn't necessarily have to be on the mat, but that's just, if she comes in the room and looks, there's a clear visual signal that, you know, we're open for business in here. Um, and if it's not down, then I just don't respond to things and it's looks like it used to in here. So that's been fairly successful. And she's, I invited her in today to hang out with me while I'm talking to you. So there she is in our video that you, that no one can see. Um, yeah, so that's just, just a, a recent training challenge with my own dog. It's not that challenging compared to some things. So I wonder, Kiki, if you could share maybe just a little bit about, I know that the training related challenge that you're talking about has been about getting Pigeon to come back into the room and kind of how you worked on that. But I'm also interested in the training related challenge that um, that preceded that when you started your master's program and um, you referenced kind of the store is closed a minute ago, I think, you know, or maybe you said open. No, the store is now open. So I'm kind of interested in maybe how you taught her the store was closed when you started your master's program. Yeah, honestly, with my dog, it wasn't that hard. She, uh, she for better or for worse, I feel like she gets, um, she's not, she's not like a super persistent animal. And I know that's a label <laughs> she's, but she, you know, she, she gives up pretty easily, which is a training challenge in other places on, on its, on its own. But, um, I think it was just basically a combination of, we just never did any, really did any training in here and all the training happened somewhere else. Um, so when I started to hang out in here, it was, uh, you know, wasn't that, and I was also super busy with what I was doing in here. It wasn't that hard to kind of lose track, just like some of us do and, um, and not pay attention to our talk. So, um, so it wasn't a big challenge there, but, um, but when you talk about the store is closed or the store is open, I know you're referencing. Um, so I, I wrote this blog post about a client case that I worked on that was more challenging that way. Um, that, and it's, I actually get a lot of requests to, uh, for information about that blog post, partially because I took it down <laughs> because I went in to edit something in it, deleted half of it and didn't realize it for several months <laughs> and then went back and read it and was like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And by then I was just too disheartened to try to rewrite it. So I just, I just removed it. Um, but the, the, the case was a dog who barked under some very specific circumstances, barked persistently at the owner. So, um, and that, 
the circumstances were when there were guests over. Um, and also to some extent when there was food. So like, you know, food in the kitchen, um, being prepared or whatever. Um, but like many, I think like, I, I'm sure we've all had cases like this where the dog only barks when there are guests or only barks at the owner when there are, um, when you're on the phone. Um, just like sometimes kids will only bother you while you're on the phone. <laughs> um, because that you, yeah, yeah, maybe only on Zoom. Yes. Um, and the reason for that is probably that most people are not going to, people might be pretty good at ignoring the dog when they're looking absorbed in Facebook or on the computer or something, but when they are talking to another human being, they get embarrassed um, and feel like they need to do something to make the dog be quiet. Um, so the dogs, you know, not maliciously, uh, but they learn, you know, this, this behavior works under these circumstances to get these outcomes. So, um, so this particular dog was, um, was barking pretty persistently at his mom um, when there were guests over. And she had done, uh, she was, she's a good trainer and she had taught him to go to a mat and stay there. But she partially, I think maybe because and I'm, I'm guessing here a little bit, partially because maybe the, she did a lot of this when there were guests over and she was trying to also deal with guests and stuff. She hadn't really built duration, um, on the behavior. So. I know for a lot of us that that behavior is kind of a go-to for this situation. Like we don't want the dog barking. So we teach them to be settled quietly on a mat and we reinforce it. And then we thin out the, the reinforcement. So we get more duration per treat. Um, and so we did that. We worked on duration and she built up to a really impressive duration. Um, but he was still very much like working on the mat. Um, and you could see, uh, like if duration got a little bit too thin, he might bark once to get it kind of going again. And like many people, as soon as he was quiet again, then she would reinforce. And so got kind of developed like a loop. And I think we could have kept working on that, but really it, the goal is to just have this dog wasn't worried about the visitors. Didn't seem worried about the visitors. He was like a friendly dog. Um, he was just really into food. And what I saw when we kind of tested a little bit is I think he's, he's barking to get food when there are guests. And this is not really the ideal solution for the owners to have to train uh, through this situation every time they have guests. And so the question when you're going to, if you're going to stop reinforcing some behavior, you're going to take some avenue to reinforcement away for an animal is what can they do instead? What other reinforcers uh, can they, can they work to get? And for him, it was reinforcing to be petted. Um, I assumed it would be reinforcing if he could just you know, relax a little bit. Um, you know, there would be some automatic reinforcement involved in that. Um, and so we sort of set up a structure to, oh, and the other thing I noticed about this particular case was that the presence of food, so the, the food was serving as a reinforcer for the quiet behavior and also for the barking. Um, but it was also part of the antecedent. It was part of the cue that this behavior was going to work. So if we took, um, so we, when we took, but when we took food out of the picture, it didn't change the picture enough with guests there that he didn't bark. And I think possibly that that is related to when there were guests, if the mat wasn't already out and he started barking, then the owner would go get the mat and the treat pouch and everything and the clicker and start to train him. So, it's, and I think a lot of this, I don't think this is like an uncommon situation where we kind of get ourselves into messes where 
because we don't start training until after the behavior starts. Um, and it's a lot for people to it's easy for a trainer who doesn't live with your dog to do this, but it's a little harder when you live with a dog 24 hours a day to always be prepared and get ahead of the behavior and set the dog up to do exactly what you want and not give them, a, you know, you're going to end up redirecting. <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to try, uh, because we couldn't change that antecedent picture enough that, you know, if we just took the food and the mat out of the picture, he wouldn't bark, you know, there's the guest there is still a cue to bark. I wanted to introduce some other new signal that basically said barking will not work, but a bunch of other behaviors will. And so then the challenge was to, um, to try to not set him up to be frustrated, if I can use a label, um, by, by not just simply not reinforcing barking. So what we did is um, I kind of set an arbitrary number. And in retrospect, I should have taken a baseline <laughs> for how long could he how long could he go without barking when there was no food or anything in the environment. And then we reinforced that short amount of quiet, which I think initially ended up being 20 seconds um, with bringing out the mat and doing some mat training. Um, and then when we put the mat away, we also added a cue to the environment, which was literally a, t a towel on the doorknob, like the old college, like don't, don't bother knocking if the van is rocking kind of signal, um, tied a, a door, a towel to the doorknob. And during the period when the towel was up, barking would not work, but approaching a person quietly would get, uh, extended petting. Um, or he, if he didn't want petting, he could go lay down next to his mom and she would pet him, or he could just go lay down somewhere. And we were, I was kind of, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I was kind of assuming there, he was doing that, then it was reinforcing. Um, and then when he was able to consistently do those 20 seconds, then we started to extend the towel period. So, um, so I get a lot of questions about, oh, can I use this protocol for this, this, or this, or this? And I think that there's not that much call to use it. <laughs> like there are often easier solutions um, where if you just remove the antecedent, the behavior won't happen, or you know, the dog can learn to settle on a mat with duration if you haven't already kind of gotten yourself into a mess with that. Um, and that was actually the disclaimer that I was going in to the blog post to add when I accidentally deleted most of it <laughs> um, was just that like, a, this shouldn't just be like, Oh, we're going to use the stores close protocol because we have barking when guests are over early. Like, it shouldn't be that pat. There should be some consideration um, because there was some extinction involved. Like it, it didn't go perfectly. I started with 30 seconds and had to go back to 20. Um, I mean, that, that's on me, but, um, you know, and he, he was, you know, took him a few reps of like four minutes or something to, to, for us to figure that out where he's barking and running around frantically, you know, it wasn't, uh, it's not, it's not like going to be my first avenue. Um, but obviously from, if you start this before you've already heavily reinforced some behavior like barking, it can obviously be really valuable. So I think that would be what I did with pigeon in this room somewhat unintentionally. <laughs> um, and I think lots of people do teach their dogs things like that unintentionally. Like they teach their dogs when they're not really available for for training or, or working or going for a walk or, or whatever it is the dog wants just by not doing it the first time. <laughs> so, so I do think it's, it's useful in terms of something to be aware of as you're raising a dog. Like, what do I, what do I want? What do I, what kind of behaviors do I want in the living room? What kind of behaviors do I want when I am watching TV, you know, and you can set those up and train them with food 
Um, and often that works just fine. And then food gets faded out once habits get built. Um, or, or you keep feeding your dog <laughs> or giving them puzzle toys or whatever. Um, and then sometimes, um, uh, sometimes other, you know, you can make just, you can just arrange things so that doing those behaviors, like, like we go in the living room when the puppy is tired or we put the puppy in the crate when they're tired and we learn, uh, that sleeping here is reinforcing napping here is reinforcing in this context. And as we know, the context of the behavior is going to get attached to that behavior consequence pair, right? So if I sleep here, you know, I feel if I nap here, I feel relaxed. Or if I, uh, if I lay down on a mat here, I get food or whatever. And that's going to get attached to the living room. Well, the next question that I was going to ask you is, um, could you share a story about a behavior you've trained or a training situation that you're proud of? And if I were you, I would certainly be proud of that training situation. But maybe there is another, maybe you have another one or two or 50 that you could share one of with us. Um, well, um, I think the, the thing that comes to mind sort of most recently are a couple of cases where... Um, where I, I did counter conditioning in a way that was different from how I had done it in the past. Um, and, uh, we're talking in September and one of them I just posted about, which is the, I don't know if you saw the thing with the ice maker. Um, so, but, uh, there are a couple of cases like this. So the first one was, um, a dog who was uh, described as being afraid of fire, which looked like he, if you did anything that predicted fire, whether it was pick up a lighter, um, move towards the button on the gas grill, um, turn the key on the gas fireplace to turn the, the gas on and then the hissing noise and then the remote control beeping of the, for the fireplace. Um, that he would bark and charge the source of the sound. Um, and I, my first thing that I tried with him, excuse me, was, um, I was like, what's the tiniest bit of this <laughs> that I can do without setting him off? And I'm going to try to do that and then make a, give him a treat. Um, and, I just had a hell of a time getting that treat to him before he did any barking. Um, and I know that I could have potentially just persisted with that. And maybe that barking would have died down as the, as the picking what I did was just pick the lighter up like an inch off the counter. Um, I, you know, that barking might've died down if I had just kept doing that. We, we often see that. Um, but for whatever reason that day, actually, actually it wasn't just for whatever reason, it was inspired by something that Eva Bertelson said at, during a panel at Clicker Expo a few years ago, um, somebody in the audience raised their hand and they, they asked a question about, it was like a specific, I can't remember what the question, it was a specific to their dog or a client dog or something. And Eva just kind of offhandedly said, and it was about counter conditioning and she offhandedly said like, Oh, let the dog start the counter conditioning trial. And I was like, what? You know, <laughs> um, um, and I thought, you know, why have I never thought of that? Like if I were being counter conditioned to spiders or something, um, would I prefer to say to the person doing it? Like, okay, I'm ready. Do it. Or would I, <laughs> would I, uh, would I prefer to just have a spider sprung on me and then get $50? Like, no, I think I would rather say, okay, go ahead and do it. So, so that kind of stuck with me. And like many things that took a couple of years to percolate, I think. <laughs> um, but so I decided, okay, this dog has a, um, you know, and then we've all been exposed to Eva and Emily's amazing and, and Peggy Hogan, everybody's sort of amazing work with so-called start buttons and, and other people's equivalent, you know, consent behaviors and things like that. Um, so I, he had a, you know, he had a behavior of getting on a mat 
and I, uh, and which happens to also be a stationary duration behavior. And so I had him, and it's not necessarily incompatible with barking, <laughs> but dogs often tend not to do it. You know, the previous dog we just talked about accepted, <laughs> like a lot of dogs don't bark when they're doing that behavior. So I put the mat out and I, um, put the mat out, he got on the mat and then I touched the lighter and gave him a treat and I was able to get the treat in there. And so, uh, so then I just, um, I let him get on the mat to say, and lay down on it to say he was ready. And I think I actually relaxed the criteria, just had to get on the mat. <laughs> um, and then I did, then I was able to introduce, uh, all these, this graded, uh, hierarchy of things that predict fire and eventually fire. Um, but the, the mat let me get my foot in the door there. Uh, and it also happened to produce a behavior that was, if not incompatible with barking, like wasn't likely to happen at the same time as barking. And I think that probably there are other behaviors that are trained into that behavior that we aren't, we can't see as well, you know, um, you know, covert behaviors, uh, physiological responses and things like that, um, that probably are also at least somewhat influenced by outcomes. <laughs> so, um, so then more recently, I got a referral from um, our local veterinary behaviorist, Dr. Ballantyne, for a dog who um, had some severe fear issues with sound stuff, both inside and outside. And um, they had had some, they had, they had very specific sounds inside that the dog was worried about. Uh, by which I mean she ran to the bathroom and pressed herself up against the bathtub when she heard them. Um, and one of them was uh, using the ice maker on the, ref on the freezer door. Um, and then the other was any Apple phone notification tones. So whether they came from a phone or an iPad or the television, um, the television ones are the most problematic because people, you know, you get those as part of a story on TV. <laughs> you can't predict when they're going to happen. Like the people have their phones turned off, basically. Um, and they had tried um, they had tried counter conditioning to the phone sounds, and they had done I think, um, but it was before I got there, so I don't know exactly how it was executed. But again, these these were people who were like you know they had they've done some training, like their dogs, no behaviors, like they have good timing. They kind of get, get it. They weren't total novices, but they tried to do counter conditioning with the tones turned all the way down and in another room. And then they also, I think, um, they put cotton in her ears, just like, they're really trying to bring the, you know, to get, keep her under threshold. Um, in terms of the intensity of the sound and she sort of started avoiding the whole setup. And I don't know if that is because of cotton in the ears or the tones, but for whatever reason, it just didn't, didn't work. And I assume they tried cotton in the ears because they couldn't get it low enough uh, just by being in another room. So um, I should ask them that <laughs> I shouldn't assume, but um, anyway, so we, pre-taught her some behaviors. We taught her a mat behavior, which she didn't, she didn't have the mat behavior in the same way that, um, like she had a go to place, but not like a relax on a mat. If that you get that distinction. And then, um, we also, uh, she liked to give paw. So we taught her to target, a like a Tupperware lid with her paw. Um, and those were the behaviors that she was going to use to, um, start the trials. So I initially actually tried, um, actually before I tried the mat, so with the, oh, there's my dog. Hang on one second. Sorry, she saw something out the window. It should really not be a, a sin for dog trainer's dog to bark on a podcast, right? <laughs> oh, you're muted. Um, 
Uh, okay. So I, um, the first thing I did with her with the ice maker was try to set her up at a distance where she, uh, was start, she startled a little bit, but she didn't totally go all the way to the bathroom and, um, to have the ice dispenser. So we, we just made it like a person reaching their glass towards the ice dispenser would predict a treat, but the treat would happen in her bowl. So she knew where it was going to go, which that tends to like, you know, stimulus predicts food in a location. You tend to get movement towards the location when the stimulus happens. Um, and we did get that. Um, and I could have tried, you know, starting with her in the bathroom or, or something like that, but it was just sort of testing things out. And she, when we did, you know, approach the ice maker food in the bowl, she, her flight distance radically decreased. Like she didn't go all the way to the bathroom, but she did do a loop. Like she would, the person would approach the ice maker and she would loop out and then come back to the food bowl. And after, you know, one session of that, I looked at that and I thought, you know, geez, I think we're training this loop. We're, you know, we're training her to go, uh, that when someone approaches the ice maker, you, you do a, a semicircle into the hallway and then come back to the bowl because her, her body language changed a little bit, but I just didn't like the look of that. Honestly, it just, I, how will I know if she's doing that, whether she's still worried or if she's just doing it because that's what we trained her to do. So then I introduced the mat and her behavior to get the ice maker going was to lay down on the mat. Um, and then the food would either, I think we started with it in her bowl and then started bringing it to her mat. Um, and we got just this fabulous performance of laying down on the mat very quickly again afterward, helicopter tail, um, you know, um, uh, and eventually like at first she would get up and go to her bowl every time. But when we started delivering the treats to the mat, she just started staying on the mat. And then we had to pick another behavior as our go behavior because she wasn't getting up and laying back down. So what we did is that when she finished eating, then she would like look at her mom and she would start wagging her tail. Um, and then we were able to work up to from like just approaching the ice maker to touching it a little bit, pushing it, letting an ice cube drop, and then like eventually like the full you know, the full ice dispense, including, you know, a piece having to fall on the floor. Oh my God. Um, and the funny thing is the other dog in the household loves ice cubes. So he comes running, um, which for some dogs that would be enough for the other dog to be like, Oh, I guess this is a good thing, but, uh, not, not in this case. Um, so we did that with that. And now what's happening is very interesting. Um, Without the mat, so what, what they do when they're going to get ice, if she's in the room, is they, 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 they take the cup and they look at her. They basically, I would interpret as they say, it's okay if I get some ice. And she lays down and then they get ice. If the mat is there, she lays down and generally stays down through multiple ice dispenses. If the mat is not there, we get a little, a little, a little circle a little hop up and circle and, but then tail wagging and approaching to get the treat. Um, and then the other neat thing that happened is because of course, a lot of people don't want to ask their dog permission every time they get ice, um, is that when they get ice, we started to do some cold trials and when they get ice, if she's not in the room, she comes running in to get her treat. Um, sometimes when she hears the treat, but starting to be when, uh, just before the treat is retrieved from the container. So just when she hears the ice dispenser, she's starting to run in. And so that's really interesting to me because how, so we look at that behavior of jumping up and doing a little semicircle and we say, Oh, the dog is scared or the dog is startled or dog doesn't like that. But it's the same stimulus. 
as in the two other situations. So how do we know that it's not what, that it's what, that that shows that the dog doesn't like it under that situation? Or how, how do we know it's not just when the mat is present, the dog has been reinforced for staying, uh, you know, for staying in one place or has very little reinforcement history for circling. That might be more to the point because we, she wasn't required to stay. She gets the treat, whether she stays or hops up from the mat. Um, but when the mat's there, she's not really been reinforced for circling, not because we have withheld reinforcement, but because it didn't happen. <laughs> um, and then when the mat's not there, we did train in that little circle and she's also been reinforced, negatively reinforced for flight. Um, and then if she hates it under either of those conditions, what explains her running toward it when, you know, so it's, um, I don't know if it's that I'm super proud of the training, although I guess I am proud of the training, but I also just think it's really interesting. It's a really interesting, raises some really interesting questions, which I like about it. Thank you so much for sharing everything that you have shared with us today. It's always a pleasure to get to chat with you and um, learn from you. So thank you very much for sharing with us today. And so for folks who want to learn more from you, can you tell us now where people can find you, um, how people could get in touch with you or see some of these great videos that you have online or your blog as well? Um, probably the central place to go would be my website, which is Kiki Yablon dog training.com. So all one word. Um, and then if from there you want to, I think I am, there are only two Kiki Yablons on Facebook and one of them is a Yorkie. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to find there. Um, and, uh, and then from there you can find my business page, whereas, which is where I post most of the videos. I don't consistently do it on my personal page, but, and then it, I'm, I've put them on Instagram too, usually. Okay, great. Yeah. So. And we will, we will link to all of that in the show notes as well. And I guess if somebody, um, I, could have said this, I should have said this at the beginning of the episode after reading your bio and such, but you talked about your virtual training services and I have had the pleasure of utilizing your virtual training services and um, had some wonderful success with Miha on some challenges uh, with the work that we did together and definitely learned a lot through that experience. So I guess if somebody else wanted to access those services, they would do that through your website? Yep, that would be the best place to go. Because there's a contact form there that, you know, gets the gets the relevant details. So, OK. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that information and for everything that you have shared with us today. We will link to all of this in the show notes. Um, this has been a lot of fun for me. So on behalf of myself, on behalf of the Animal Training Academy community and of everybody listening today, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's really appreciated. Thanks for having me here. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.